again to whatever they're studying in that part of the curriculum. So, um, and so that really makes it worthwhile. Uh, this was some event years ago, some kind of a, I was a thing of American Arab friendship, and so our, our older, these are, these were, um, I think these were fourth, fifth, and sixth graders at the time that went to represent our school um, at that event. And uh, that was a Native American festival that the first, second, third grade went to. They really enjoyed that a lot. <coughs> and that's at a camp out. The first, second, third grade are the ones that have their first uh, camp out experience. So we go to a place on the eastern shore called Echo Hill School. There's a lot of places you could choose from. And um, you know, the first graders, it's a really big deal for them to go for one night. Um, and it's optional. And so, but, but by the time they get to their second year, they're all looking forward to it. And the second and third years, uh, they get to stay for two nights, which is a big deal for them. And so um, that's a photo from that. Um, <clears throat> this is just a photo of an older student um, you know, working uh, with the Earth. Marie Montessori was a really big believer in getting the children involved in um, caring for the Earth, um, working with the Earth, um, having live specimens in the classroom, whether it's you know, snails or whether it's plants or an aquarium, whatever it might be, uh, that biological aspect was really, really important to Montessori and something that um, is you know, critical in today's world. You know, one of, I think, the top 10 most important books for, for parents to read is called The Last Child in the Woods, and it's about how um, the amount of time our children are spending in nature is diminishing and diminishing, and what the impact is on them, what the impact is on our society. So that's a pitch for, for a good book. This is a, we have the good fortune of being near the Potomac River, so this was an outing there. Um, and, uh, <coughs> you know, when you do these outings, there's a lot of ways uh, to connect geology with geography, with history. Very close to that spot is a place where John, Captain John Smith um, uh, supposedly uh, uh, went up the river with a, a, a group of Native American guides, and he described the very spot that's right, right near there. And so that's it, something for older kids to be, um, be interested in, but that's an interesting way to connect things together. And um, at the elementary level, the classrooms continue to be very collegial, studious, inspiring, and fun places to be. And so, um, you know, students learn how to work with each other, they learn how to respect each other's space. One of the most important things they learn that they tell me is how they had to learn how to deal with a lot of different personalities. They had to learn learn how to deal with different um, strengths that people had, and uh, and so that's that's a one of the important byproducts. And uh, that's just a shot of the, an older classroom. I think that's a Spanish class, probably a middle school, just to give you some visuals. And I think we're getting close to the end here. <coughs> um, You'll notice as students get older, now right now you're contemplating an elementary school, maybe one day you'll have a middle school and beyond, who knows, but what you find as the students get older, they really grow together as a unit. Some of them will not continue, some of them will move away, new ones will come, but there's that integral unit. And they really bond together, as I mentioned earlier, they, they really get to be like a, a family, and why is that important? Well, as they start getting older into their teenage years, their adolescent years, they start um, do, you know, being interested in adolescent type things. So girlfriends, boyfriends, for example, their, uh, their identity, who they want to be, how they want to dress, those kind of things. And so in a Montessori community, they uh, are in a safe environment, an emotionally safe environment for them to try um, those things out, and that's a talk for another night. I'll come back in about three or four years. <laughs> um, but uh, um, and we didn't want to leave out physical fitness. Um, and, you know, mind, body, fitness, and physical fitness very important in Montessori. Uh, if we have time, I can talk to you about uh, the opportunities and the possibilities for your elementary students. 
but it's certainly something that is a very big factor um, and uh, something that you know you want to plan for and think about how you're going to how as a school you're going to make that work typically Montessori schools are smaller so the sports element is something you have to be a little creative about so at our school we have a squash club we have a running club uh, we have intramural soccer intramural um, basketball we have um, intramural volleyball and so on and we also have an ecology club that we call earth keepers uh, that might go out and, and explore nature and do things like this. And so, um, certainly can talk a lot more about that. And just, um, I've given you a lot of information, and just as a wrap up, um, there are a number of good books about Montessori, um, some of them quite recent. One of the best ones is The Science Behind the Genius. And this is a quote from that book, no other single educational curriculum comes close to the Montessori curriculum in terms of its levels of depth, breadth, and interrelationship across time and topic. And so um, I've also included some links here for you, um, which um, Kim um, can certainly provide for you. Um, and if you don't, um, if you want to just take the simple route, just go on to Montessori.org. Um, there are other um, great um, sources of, of um, information. This is the one that I'm most familiar with. One link is about um, frequently asked questions for Montessori parents. Another one is about research. And um, uh, I think the bottom one is a blog about um, that, that have different posts and things like that. Um, so anyway, just an overview, just an introduction. Um, it's something that uh, I can say with uh, a lot of confidence that being a part of a Montessori community has been a very gratifying thing for me as an educator. I've seen many, many parents go through the journey that you're on now and that you're contemplating. And, um, and uh, I, I try my best to stay in touch with all of them uh, all around the world and keep up with their, their children. And so why don't we pause and see what questions you might have and see um, if there is anything specific <coughs> that I can share with you or answer with you or point you in the right direction. And uh, don't hesitate to ask any question because um, uh, I think it's important that we, 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 we share those questions and we process. It's a, it's a big decision for you as parents and it's one that you want to be really well informed about and that's uh, what I hope to be able to do. I will take a break and see what you'd like to know that I haven't already covered. Yes? My biggest question is, for some reason, you know, if we put our kids to do this multiple system, and at some point in our lives, we have to transition them to, to mm -hmm. another school system, whether it's in the middle of elementary school or middle school, yeah. how did they how easy or how hard is that transition given the curriculum is different and, yeah. and the, the school environment is different and general normally public school systems are a bit more structured. So I mean, can they adopt it? That's my biggest question. It's a really good question. It's one of the most frequently asked questions. I would say that Montessori kids are about the most adaptable human beings that there are. Um, I've seen Montessori students at our school go to every other private independent school in the Washington area pretty much for high school and um, also to many different public schools. And I also have seen Montessori students go to other countries and to, and to, and to go to school there. Um, it's inherent in the Montessori um, approach for them to learn how to learn and to be their own best advocates and to be the drivers of their educational process, to be good um, communicators and good organizers. So. Regardless of where they go, they are able to adapt. Uh, they might go somewhere that they find that they don't uh, understand the system or don't agree with things, and so you might find them, you know, having a meeting with the principal, like some of my students have done, to say, "Why don't you have more healthy lunches in the, in the cafeteria?" Um, but um, there's no question that they will adapt, and uh, you know, oftentimes they're quite advanced relative to their peers, so that's one thing to bear in mind, and so um, 
So you would want to have a conversation at that point with whoever that school would be, because the, typically the students are not just advanced, you know, in terms of where they're at in their math level. They're really advanced in their thinking level and their level, their ability to form ideas and so on and so forth. But generally speaking, it's it's not it's a non-issue. I can I can say with a lot of confidence, and um, so. It's something that wherever they go, public or private, they're going to do fine. Our students that are going into public high school right now are um, are very advanced in, in, in math, very advanced in, in their literature and their writing, um, in foreign language. They're, they're two or three grade levels ahead of where their peers are at. Um, so you can be pretty confident in, in that. Am I answering your question? Sorry. Yeah. Yes. To follow on that, um, you said that they're more advanced. Yes. Um, how do they fit in, or do they actually stand out? Is that positive or negative? Yeah. Um, well, uh, they tend to be very, very uh, thoughtful people, very caring people in general. They tend to be very um, confident in who they are, and. Um, Sometimes that sets them apart in the sense that um, they go into an environment that's sometimes not as caring or that is not as thoughtful. And so, um, as I mentioned a minute ago, sometimes they want to um, end up being the leader of a club or initiating some kind of um, program or activity. So um, they end up being leaders in one way or another. So like one of our graduates um, from two years ago, the high school she went to did not have a sailing team. And so she's a passionate sailor. And so she went to the principal and asked uh, them to, um, if she could found a sailing club. So she did. So, and then they didn't, then some of the kids wanted to sail, but they didn't really know how to sail. So she ended up you know, teaching them how to sail. And so, and now they have a sailing club. So uh, I think that the, the, the ways that they stand out are good ways. Um, they, they, they tend to be courageous. They'll stand up for right and wrong. Um, they'll speak out on behalf of kids that are being teased or bullied. Um, they tend to be very empathetic, but they tend to be very courageous as well. Um, one of the things that um, is important is that they tend to be, um, to have a strong personal ethical code. So when I showed you, you know, shots of some of the older Montessori kids, um, they've had a chance to really um, debate and to talk about different scenarios and situations and explore different things. And so they, um, they have a very strong sense of what their own personal right or wrong is. And as a parent, that's really one of the most important things that you want because at some point they are going to um, fly your, the nest, you know. And really, once they get to high school, um, you know, your level of control or whatever is diminished. At that point, you really trust you've done all that work, you know. So um, I would say that they stand out, but they stand out in good ways, in strong ways, and I would think ways that you would want your child to, you know, to be, you know. Andrew, can I just add one yeah, thing? Please, yeah, please, I just wanted to say that in my experience has been, um, and seeing my daughter, even though she did not go through lower elementary in uh, Montessori, but. One of the biggest things I notice in a Montessori child is that they, they don't need the dependency on others to validate themselves, which I think is a very important thing, especially as they get older into these teenage years. They're secure in themselves. They're secure in their thought process because they've been successful at a, lower, at a younger age to be able to figure things out on their own. So they don't need um, that external validation, which I think is a very important thing. It's a hard thing when, they are, you know, my daughter's 16 and my son's 13. And they're going to that time in their life where it's, you know, so that's the biggest blessing I think for Montessori. You know, my uh, and you'll meet her one day. My my teacher from 35, 40 years ago, who um, who taught me in a in a primary classroom. Uh, she just retired from Aiden Montessori, and she. I just remember her passion uh, is what drove me to really become interested in the sciences. She would just light up, you know, when she talked about the the vertebrae, and it was just, you know, and that's the difference that they don't get necessarily. And I think that's. It's benefit of our program. Yeah, I think that's a really, really strong point. You know, when they get to be adolescents, they get to be in high school, there's just a tremendous amount of peer pressure. So they are being faced with all, all those kind of challenges. And so 
that strong personal ethical code that I was speaking about, um, you know, that really uh, helps them a lot. It really helps them a lot. And, uh, you know, to have that strong sense of self, my personal values, what do I believe in, um, they've had all those years of working that through for themselves. Good question. There must be other questions, though. Yes. I'd just love to make a testament to Mr. Tim here. Our son was here for a few years, and he's now in kindergarten. The teachers are teaching 2 plus 3 equals 5, and my son raises his hand and says, well, 100 divided by 20 equals 5. And the <laughs> teacher in the school system is like, we're going to save that for another day. Yeah. <laughs> another year. I mean, it, it, Mr. Tim has really, it's been amazing um, what you've given Logan at six and a half years old. So thank you. That's nice okay. to hear. Yeah. Um, so that, Mr. Ted? Yeah. Yeah. I always hear that. The parents are eager to know if my child on track. Yep. Whether it's core curriculum or right. what a first grader should know. Right. <clears throat> so less pressure that they, they need to evolve at their own pace. So almost the opposite of that, that I don't expect them to necessarily meet those goals because they have to get there. I mean, is there not statistical data, but how, how does that work as it gets into the yeah. later years? Right, so a couple of things. So there are, you know, even though every child is going, every student's going at their own pace, there are targets, you know. There's targets for where we want them to be, maybe at first grade, second grade, third grade. They, they often might exceed those targets, um, but you know, you have a sense of where a first, second, third grader is headed, and if the if someone is not um, kind of headed in that direction at a pace that you think they might should be because of their intelligence level, then sometimes it's about finding a way to um, challenge them in a more interesting way or to move them forward a little bit better. Uh, sometimes it might mean that someone uh, has some challenges that we don't know about. So at our school we work with a team of people and so if a student is really, really uh, bright but they're having some difficulty kind of learning phonics, um, then we look at that a little more closely and do some evaluation to see what that might be. Uh, so as a professional Montessori educator, you're pretty, you know, the training level is quite high and so you know where a first grader kind of should be, you know where they could be if they want to be, but you kind of know where they should be. Um, and so you're, you're, you're always having that in the forefront of your mind. And then depending on the Montessori school, pretty much all of us now, Montessori schools, we need to do some form of, of, of national testing. I'm not a big fan of it, but we do that starting in third grade. Uh, Stanford Achievement Test, our kids score in the 90th percentile. Um, and so uh, on everything, um, pretty much. And so, uh, and we do that every year, third year through eighth grade. Um, but I don't, as an educator, need that as validation, but it's something we have to do. And then also Montessori School, it's not like the students are, are not um, evaluated and tested. There's probably more evaluation and more testing in the best sense of the word going on every day in a Montessori classroom than in other classrooms. It's just more meaningful because it's, it's more personalized and it's more individualized. And so our students in the first, second, third grade, they begin to know what a quiz is, they begin to know what a test is, but they also know that when they, they master a certain Montessori material, that's a really exciting moment. And they invite their teacher over to show, to show that teacher what they've done. And so evaluation happens in in those ways as well. And really important for all of us, I feel, to remember that in a Montessori school, you are, as parents, supporting the emotional and social development of your children, <coughs> not just the, the uh, intellectual or cognitive development, the academic development. And just everywhere you turn, there's research to show that if your child is in an environment that they feel good about who they are, and they have a community of supportive people, and it's not stressful, but it's challenging, all across the board, um, students are going to learn better. They're going to score better. And, and I could point you in a lot of directions for that. But you might want to look at Yale University's Department of Emotional Intelligence and some of the data that they're coming up with. It's pretty staggering. 
Uh, on, the, on the contrary, then, is also true. If, this, if these children are in an environment that's stressful, um, if they're in an environment of high competition, if they're in an environment where they're not validated as people, if they're not in an environment that is uh, peaceful and supportive, uh, they're not going to do as well. So it's a long-winded answer. It's a good question. Yeah? Kind of building on that question, to what extent does the state of Maryland sort of influence <coughs> the curriculum or the guidelines of the program? Yeah. Well, um, each state is different. Uh, in the state of Maryland, uh, we still have a large measure of, of freedom in terms of creating our curriculum. Um, I am 100% confident that, um, that TJ and Kim, as they create the curriculum for the, the uh, first, second, third grade based upon the Montessori elementary curriculum, um, it's with a view toward uh, what, what is the state doing, what's the county doing, or whatever. As uh, professionals, you want to always be responsible to that, but you don't want to be beholden to that because, in the sense, you don't want to be um, uh, having the kids, you know, tested um, ad nauseum all the time on information and data that's really not very useful or not very interesting. And so you want to retain the best of Montessori, which is the inspiration, the big picture thinking, the connectedness, following your own interests, you know. And one of the things that um, really gets lost in a traditional classroom is that ability to say to your son or, or your daughter, you're really interested in the Middle Ages, um, go for it. You know, we're going to find a way for you to build your reading skills and to build your, uh, your, 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 your architecture interest uh, and to build your mathematical skills. We're going to find a way to connect that to your passion, which is the Middle Ages, and very difficult to do in, a, in another environment. And so, uh, so you know, basically, you're you're in an environment where um, it's uh, it's 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 not um, regimented uh, according to some prescribed thing. It's 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 individualized, and yet you're in an environment of professionals that are not going to let your child fall through the cracks. Good questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, so in, I guess in the later years, uh, how much is parent involvement is, is there with uh, the children? I'm glad you're asking that. You're, you know, it, one of the beautiful things about being a part of the Montessori community is that you have um, a parent community to, to be a part of in a very real sense. You're, you're all here tonight taking some time out of your evening. Um, and you are, um, you, you know, you're partners with, uh, with the teachers and with the school and in a very real sense. I showed you some pictures of our United Nations Day. That's just one example of a, a huge event that we would never, ever be able to put on if it were not for our parents. And we, we do like six events a year, not on that scale. Um, but on a more practical level, um, you have access to your teachers. You have the ability to ask questions, you have the ability to uh, come into the classroom and give a lesson on something if it's pertaining to the curriculum of what they're studying. It's a, it's a, it's a very special thing to be a parent in a Montessori community. It's something I've really appreciated. Some of the best ideas and some of the best suggestions, some of the best innovations that I've gotten over the years from, from that I've received, that I've implemented, have been from parents. And so as a good professional, you always want to be open-minded. You want to always want to be have an open ear and to listen. So I've grown to really partner um, a lot with our parents. We have a very active parent association. Um, their main goal is to support the school, support the teachers. How can we help? Well, how can we make it better? And so um, it's a really good question. So you have a partnership in a true sense of the word uh, where you uh, – you have, as I said, access to the teachers. You have access, and I'm, I'm using this word access because that's not always the case. And so, uh, in a Montessori school, it's, 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 it is the case because it's so valued. It's so valued. And uh, yeah, you showed us some pictures of yeah. like science projects and yeah. things like that. Do they bring those home? Do they have the parents get involved with assignments? Is there homework? <laughs> yes. Just because I think as parents we're so trained, we have uh, a son that's getting ready for the middle school. Right. And as parents, maybe we're just so programmed to saying, okay, if there's no homework, we're not learning anything. 
right. you know, and public school are experiencing there has been very little homework. So obviously in in the pre primary there hasn't been any in the Montessori setting. What does that look like? Right. Well it's a it's a school by school decision about homework, but um, we find a middle ground. We do do homework at our school. Um, for us it's a practice of what the students have learned. It's also supposed to be a somewhat innovative, so there's some creative, creative element to it. And the third thing is when they're pre preparing for a project, um, they will be working on that um, often at home, maybe in addition to school. So the Science Fair project is an example of one. They're doing that at home. So they have their scientific process. They've chosen a topic. They need to do their tests and their measurements. Um, these are first, second, third graders I'm talking about. And so as a parent, you kind of, you know, you're a part of that process, you know, uh, for better or for worse, you know, in terms of the, the science uh, science fair. Some parents don't like it, others get really into it. Um, so, uh, so yes, um, that is, uh, you know, I think that it's, it's a school by school decision and I think it's something that, uh, in this day and age, I feel having the students have some responsibility and some self-discipline to do something um, at home is valuable. You know, there, there is a body of research out there showing that homework has very little value. Um, so it's a debate. But um, I think I think most Montes well, I think many Montessori schools that I know that I work with have, have homework in some fashion. It's just that they try to make it more meaningful, less mindless, more innovative and more connected to these bigger term projects, and most importantly, connected to a student's interests. Did I answer your question? Good questions. All right. Yes. I have one more. Yeah. How about, how about exams? Exams. Well, um, as the students get older, I mentioned that in the first, second, third grade, they learn about quizzes, they learn about tests, and things like that. I'm trying to think if we use the word exam, I think maybe. Um, we do, um, you know, for the older kids, you know, for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, I think. Um, but starting at fourth grade, uh, for us, you know, maybe third grade, but certainly fourth grade, they um, get used to the concept, okay, we have four, four quarters of the year, and um, we arrange the curriculum according to those quarters, and so, they get used to having a, a, a test at the end of that quarter on their on their knowledge. Um, but the written test that they take will not be the only way that we assess them. So remember I mentioned the independent projects? So, so they have to take a written test, but then they have to stand in front of the, their peers um, and do a presentation. And, uh, and oftentimes it's with a PowerPoint um, or some platform like that. And they choose a topic, very Montessori, they choose a topic. So this year I sat and listened to some great presentations. Some, one student was really interested in uh, Ebola, uh, the history of Ebola. Another student was interested in, um, um, in um, the, I forget the exact term, but plants that live from the air. Um, all around the world in the Amazon and how they, you know, how, how, uh, how, how unique they are and how they could possibly help science and things like that. So anyway, they're presenting in front of a group um, uh, independently, they get graded on that, and then their group presentations they get graded on as well. And when I say graded, um, part of the grade is their peers are evaluating them, which I think is very special about a Montessori classroom. They learn how to to accept evaluations from their peers. And the, it's not random, there's a, what we call rubrics we create. So if you were the peers and I was a student and I was presenting, you guys would be evaluating me on how organized my presentation was, how clearly I spoke, did I really know the material, um, and they have a way of knowing that because they, they, you know, they can evaluate that as well. And so in a monastery classroom, yes, there are exams, but there are these other ways of evaluating. Um, yeah. When you say that, so when, especially having them all the way up to almost high school, yeah. is there some kind of written, like a report card, just thinking for when they apply to other things and that's something that they have to produce? Yep. <coughs> yeah, um, there are report cards, there are progress reports. We do them elementary. three, yes, all the way down elementary. We do them three times a year, um, and that's something that you, you know, I'm sure that you can expect in some form or another. Depending on the Montessori school, it can look more traditional or it can look a little different, like in the checklist format. 
let's say it is a little different, so what we do is we provide uh, an explanation of it for you, the parents, and then if they were to apply to another school, we provide them with a very clear uh, description 